more children are surviving pediatric cancer. Pediatricians must be increasingly aware of current guidelines for managing these patients. Here today to give us an update on these issues is Dr. Melissa Hudson. Dr. Hudson is director of the Cancer Survivorship Division in the Department of Oncology at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. In this capacity, she directs the After Completion of Therapy Clinic, which monitors over 5,000 long-term childhood cancer survivors treated at St. Jude. This clinic provides a screening and prevention plan that integrates cancer experience with healthcare needs. Dr. Hudson has shared this model of care with other centers through the involvement of national groups developing recommendations for long-term survivors of pediatric cancer. Today we are pleased that she can share this model with us in her session, Long-Term Care Follow-Up for Pediatric Cancer Survivors. Dr. Hudson. Good morning, it's my privilege to share with you the success about pediatric cancer and how we are dealing with the consequences of this success. In my brief time, I hope that you will come away being able to anticipate the challenges to transitioning and implementing optimal survivor care and appreciate the prevalence and spectrum of late effects developing after childhood cancer. Uh, I will provide you with resources uh, to apply the components of risk-based survivor care so that you can identify uh, also within your community and hope that you'll come away recognizing the ideal standards of survivorship care. Uh, this is the success story uh, as demonstrated by the progress in pediatric cancer survival achieved over the last 40 to 50 years. And we see that with the proportion surviving uh, in the years from diagnosis that uh, essentially 80% or more children diagnosed with cancer will become long-term survivors. Uh, the statistics on childhood and adolescent survivorship are such that 13,500 new cases of cancer are diagnosed in the United States per year. And we actually are seeing a relative increase in uh, cancer diagnoses since the year of 1975 with a rate of 0.5% per year. Five-year survival rates, as I said previously, exceed 80%. And with that success, we have in excess of 379,000 individuals living in the United States diagnosed with cancer before the age of 21. Uh, the childhood cancer survivor numbers now with this increased rate and successful therapy are expected to increase to 420,000 by the end of 2013 and such that one of every 750 individuals in the United States uh, is, will be estimated to be a survivor of childhood or adolescent cancer. And we know that with those numbers increasing, you will be increasingly seeing them in your practices. Now, it's important to reflect on the care across the survivors spectrum and how that changes over time. At diagnosis of cancer, the children come into a pediatric oncology uh, treatment center where our primary interventions are risk-adapted therapy considering the cancer and host-related factors. And as they achieve long-term survival, uh, we begin these secondary interventions uh, such as health education, cancer screening for both primary and subsequent neoplasms, and the risk-reducing interventions to preserve their health. It's important that over this time, and particularly with passing time, that these individuals will then re-enter and reintegrate back into primary care, and that primary care providers such as pediatricians have an important role to play in helping the survivor uh, maintain and preserve health and have an optimal quality of life after cancer. Now, the components of effective transition include uh, education and anticipatory guidance for the survivor about their cancer history, its specific cancer-related health risk, health screening and surveillance recommendations related to their specific treatment exposures, importantly, the impact of the health behaviors on cancer-related health risk, how they uh, may need guidance in self-management of chronic health conditions, which are quite common after cancer, how to navigate through the adult health care system as they leave our pediatric practices, and what resources are available that may vary both nationally and regionally to maintain access to health care and manage their chronic health conditions. 
Now, let's talk about these chronic health conditions, which we are always trying to consider as we're balancing the cost of our cure. Uh, the health conditions I'm speaking of are late effects, which are those that are persisting or developing five or more years from cancer diagnosis. And we know that these represent the cost of cure, and we optimally try to anticipate those even as we're planning our cancer treatment interventions at diagnosis. Uh, these health conditions comprise a spectrum of physical uh, complications that may impact growth and development, including linear growth, skeletal maturation, intellectual functioning, emotional and social maturation, and sexual development. Pretty much any organ function uh, may be affected based on the specific treatment exposure. Uh, fertility and reproduction are often impacted with some of our most common therapies, and it's important for us to consider that often these are a lower priority at the time of diagnosis, and we're trying to anticipate that better as pediatric oncologists. Uh, many survivors also will have concerns about the health of their offspring, and there may be some risk in a select subset. Survivors also uh, have a risk for subsequent neoplasms related to specific treatment, in some cases genetic factors, and these include uh, concerns regarding recurrent or of their primary cancer, uh, but also second neoplasms, which may uh, comprise a spectrum of both uh, low-grade or benign lesions as well as high-grade malignancies that can be life-threatening. It's important to also consider the psychosocial effects of cancer, which may not be related to their treatment at all, but simply the cancer experience. And these may impact their mental health. Uh, they may have physical and body image issues following their cancer treatment. Uh, education and vocation may be derailed because of the cancer experience or uh, late cognitive effects or, or uh, psychosocial effects related to their cancer experience. Our survivors, despite the new health care laws, are still struggling with insurance discrimination and difficulties with access to care. Uh, and this can actually uh, lead to other issues as, uh, as survivors may be dealing with financial and economic issues related to medical bills or also financial and economic issues related to under and unemployment. Many of our survivors will deal with chronic symptoms, uh, as listed there, chronic fatigue or disrupted sleep or memory and concentration issues or even chronic pain. And some of our very uh, impaired survivors actually may have difficulty living independently, and we need to help them achieve uh, access to resources uh, to optimize their quality of life. Uh, survivors may also have problems with social interactions that range from interactions with family and also peer relationships. And uh, this, some of this may stem in some cases from cancer-related stigma. Now, I want you to appreciate that these chronic health conditions, both physical and psychological, are actually quite common. I'd like to illustrate that by sh this by showing you some data from our recent uh, publication on the St. Jude Lifetime Cohort Study. This information is showing the prevalence of health conditions in our childhood cancer survivors evaluated in the study. We, uh, we, did, we evaluated through medical assessments over 1,700 adult survivors who were diagnosed at a median age of six years and were studied at a median age of 32 years with this, the group ranging from 18 years up to 60 years in diagnosis. And they were a median of 25 years from their cancer treatment. And this figure shows uh, on the y-axis the cumulative prevalence in relation to the age and years of that survivor. And you can see with increasing age, survivors have an increasing prevalence of chronic health conditions, such that with this, uh, this data we estimated by age 45, 95.5 percent of our survivors will have at least one chronic health condition, and almost 81 percent will have a serious disabling or life-threatening condition. And we know that these conditions in some cases may predispose our survivors to late mortality. And this is sharing data from the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, a retrospective cohort study that has been monitoring the health of over 20,000 cancer survivors treated in 26 institutions in North America. And on the, uh, the y-axis here we have the survival function estimates in, re in relation to years from diagnosis. And first at the top uh, curves we see the population controls for U.S. At female and male mortality. Uh, and this population actually is still quite young. They're in their mid-20s. And you see the uh, survival gap there uh, in comparison of cancer survivors participating in the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study. And we know that uh, these uh, chronic health conditions place them at a higher uh, rate of premature mortality. And in looking at survival mortality ratios, the top conditions that are contributing to this mortality are su subsequent malignancies with a 15-fold excess risk of death, cardiac conditions, sevenfold excess risk of death, and pulmonary conditions, almost a ninefold excess risk of death. Now, 
I want you to appreciate that we've appreciated the, that these chronic health conditions uh, do impact our survivors, and they've been a important stimulus for change in pediatric cancer therapy. Initially, the recognition of late effects in young patients was more focused on the cosmetic uh, abnormalities that we appreciated early on. But as our survivor cohorts have aged, we've begun to understand the importance of our treatments and the impact of our treatments on uh, early onset of heart disease and, uh, and premature con uh, aging conditions such as uh, subsequent malignancies as illustrated here with the mammography demonstrating a malignant breast lesion. Now, with this information, we have changed our therapy. As I said previously, we we're using a risk-adapted approach such that during the time that pediatricians and pediatric oncologists are monitoring survivors, we really don't see uh, a high prevalence of the very severe life-threatening conditions such as cardiomyopathy, pulmonary fibrosis, and high-grade second cancers. But we do see a variety of life-altering conditions that are listed here, anything from cognitive deficits, infertility, seizure disorders, again, low-grade subsequent malignancies are, uh, subsequent cancers are common, hearing and vision loss, and chronic pain. Our concern is the uh, many conditions that our survivors are experiencing uh, ac actually pose a risk for them as they age and, and continue to collect more uh, comorbid conditions, and this may, in fact, uh, subsequently lead to and, and contribute to an earlier mortality, even though we've changed our therapies early on to reduce these risks. So what we recommend for our survivors is to consider all of the factors that may contribute to the potential risk of a given late effect. These include considerations of host factors, such as age and gender and race, premorbid conditions that those, those patients bring to their cancer experience, genetic factors which may have influenced their risk for development of, of, of their first cancer, but also may also uh, impact drug distribution, their tolerance to, uh, acute tolerance to therapy, as well as the risk of late effects. Tumor factors uh, such as histology, site, and re biology and response directly uh, relate to the treatment that that survivor ultimately will need to achieve and sustain long-term survival and remission. And these may be anything from a spectrum of surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy. Treatment events are important to, uh, to consider as well because uh, often there may be life-threatening infections or transfusions delivered that may have some uh, long-term impact on their health. A, a big area of study now is the impact of aging on our survivors' health and what we can do to promote healthy aging as we appear to see a, an accelerated pattern of aging with the onset of and development of chronic health conditions that are much more typical for older populations. And if I can, ex if I can emphasize anything, I want to emphasize the importance of redirecting that survivor back to addressing lifestyle issues and health behaviors that may modify their risk for uh, late complications after treatment and their risk of, of health problems as they age. So, Considering all these factors is what we consider as the ideal survivorship care, which is risk-based survivor care. This includes surveillance for primary and subsequent cancers, screening and management of late effects, assessment and support of psychosocial functioning, education about their cancer-related health risk and behaviors and conditions that are modifying that risk, and then importantly, assistance with identifying and meeting medical and psychosocial challenges. There are a variety of tools to optimize the transition of survivorship care. Uh, survivors ideally will be presenting to your practices with a treatment summary. If you do not have that treatment summary, I encourage you to call the Pediatric Cancer Treatment uh, uh, center and uh, request a summary because it will be important for you to be able to guide their care. There are evidence-based practice guidelines that are consensus-based in their recommendations uh, for screening, but the evidence is their evidence informed as we have connected from the extant literature, the uh, relationships between therapeutic exposures and these chronic health conditions. Uh, everyone has a different model of care or infrastructure within their communities uh, that will impact your ability to deliver care. Uh, some of you may be very fortunate to have access to a long-term follow-up program, but most or many will not. And in these cases, you need to figure out what model of care and how care can be shared between the Pediatric Cancer Center and those transitions can be facilitated between oncology care and pediatric care, and then important between pediatric care and uh, adult care uh, as these survivors age. Uh, by 2000, 
15, the Cancer and Commission is, uh, it has uh, stated that every uh, survivor should have a survivorship care plan that defines the roles and providers uh, within that, uh, the specific model of care for that community. We are looking forward to that day, and we know that this is a resource-intensive uh, uh, initiative to provide uh, such a care plan, but it's critical to help optimize their long-term health. So I'm going to lead you, leave you with uh, the slide that shows the, um, the, the resource uh, that we've developed through the Children's Oncology Group, the long-term follow-up guidelines for survivors of childhood and adolescent young adult cancers. This is version three, uh, but we are actually, we will be posting by the end of the year, the beginning of next year, version four. Uh, these, are, this, these guidelines represent 136 sections detailing exposure-based potential late effects and screening recommendations. Uh, we grade the evidence linking exposure to a potential late effect. We provide within these guidelines recommendations for second cancer screening recommendations for standard and high-risk groups. And I hope that you will find in particular helpful the health links for patient education. We have over 40 of these health links now. Uh, many have been translated into Spanish and French and because we work with uh, North American partners in Canada. And these are great uh, standalone uh, patient education handouts that can be printed free of charge for your patients in your community. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you.